Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and the only way to the Father. He's saying, I'm the sustenance of that spiritual life. And if you eat my words, or you hear my words, your spirit is going to live. If you accept me into your life, the word of God, you accept me into your life, I'm gonna give you the sustenance of life so you can continue to live after your flesh dies. You are born a sinner. It says anyone who is born of Adam in this flesh sins because they are born of the fallen state of man. But that's why you have to be born again into the spirit. Jesus Christ covers your sin. Anything you did in the past is covered because you become a new creature in Christ. And anything you did in the future, he's covered that also. His redemption is eternal. If you partake of the communion table, if you partake of the tithe, you're acknowledging that you are his. And if you're not partaking of these things, what are you saying? Death by definition, separation from God. Are we truly wanting God? Are we truly wanting to be delivered from separation from God? Welcome to another segment of The Time Is Now, where the Word of God is truth and power. Today, we'll be talking about communion. My name is Pastor Charles White. Hey, I'm Sean McDermott. Glad to be here. Hey, I'm Matthew Iricus. Also glad to be here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you have people come and they do these long rituals for the communion table, and people think that it's a ceremony. But if you get a true understanding of the communion table, then everything makes sense. The Bible makes sense. Everything Jesus came to do makes sense. So we could be explaining and talking about the communion table. Okay, we're going to start with 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24 through 26. And it states, And when he had given thanks, he broke the bread and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, he took the cup, and when it supped, he said this, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. Now, if you understand and hear what I just read, Jesus gave us really two criteria here. He says, take the bread, eat it. It's his broken body. And we're going to go into that in detail in a minute. And he took the cup and said, this is the new covenant in my blood. And all he stated is, often as you do this, do it in remembrance of him. He didn't say do it trying to remember your sins. He didn't say make a ritual out of it and remember all these other things. He said just do these two things, and always when you do it, do it in remembrance of him. The communion message is one of the most powerful messages that you can give, and this is why when we first come together in church every, every service, we do the communion because we want to bring everybody into remembrance of what Jesus did and what his broken body stood for. But if you understand a lot of people tell you that Jesus came to stop you from sinning. Jesus came to stop you from doing this. Jesus came to change your behavior. But when you really hear what the message of Jesus was throughout the Bible, we're going to talk about it. It is that Jesus came to take away sin. It says that Jesus came and take away the sins of the world. Jesus came to offer himself as a sacrifice for sin. Jesus came to save his people from their sins. And you have to go back to what Jesus is saying and get a full understanding of what he's saying. If he saved you from your sins, then... It can't be about you stop sinning. He said, if you stop sinning, then the power's in you. If he saved you from the sin, then the power's in him. So that's what we could be discussing today about Jesus Christ and his power. That's why I said the word is truth and his power. Because Jesus Christ was the word of God and he's the power of God. So when we add these two together, it's about what Jesus did, not what we can accomplish in our flesh. The communion, we do it every time that we meet. I was at a church before God had called me to the truth where we took it once a month and oftentimes you find churches saying it's expensive or what have you but when you're truly called from God you got to remember that God came to save the broken when you're broken you need encouragement <laughs> it's not an easy road it's the only road that's why I think back always when Peter says like where else are we going to go where else are you going to go but you do need encouragement and a lot of churches will bring you to a point of like I don't know, they give you something, like, your blessing's coming now, encouragement. That's not the encouragement. The encouragement is, this is a hard road, but the work is completed. It is finished. And that's the communion, that Jesus has finished it, that he has brought us into a new covenant, and that we can rejoice greatly in, we do not have to stay here, that God came into the world to retrieve what was lost and bring it back home. I just don't know how the, the church has allowed 
the communion to be twisted into where you need to make yourself righteous before you remember that Jesus has made you righteous. That's, uh, I mean, if you were selling gym memberships and you could only accept people who are in shape, you may have one or two people there. You're not going to make a lot of money. And the whole point is to remember what Jesus has done. And that's why a lot of churches are off track because it doesn't start with Jesus. And whatever starts in dysfunction ends in, ends in dysfunction. So you can see from communion all the way to the tithe, all the way from Genesis, all the way to Revelation, the focal point is Jesus. So I'm going to read from Ezekiel exactly what God said he's going to do, and I'm going to show you in the New Testament why he started to accomplish exactly what he said he was going to do. He said, But I had pity for my holy name, which the house of Israel has profaned before the heathens where they went. Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus said the Lord God, I do this not for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the heathens where you went. I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathens, which you have profaned in the midst of them, and the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, said the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. I will take you from among the heathens, also the heathens mean Gentiles, and gather you out of all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all of your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. Listen carefully what God said. He says, I am going to cleanse you. He didn't say you're going to stop. He said, I am going to cleanse you. He said, I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. Everything is because of what God is doing. Man has, it has nothing to do with man's ability to do anything. Everything that man does is because of the ability that God and Jesus Christ has given him. It's only because of the power of God that he's placed inside of us. John 6, Pastor, you pointed out many times is a lot of people were following Jesus because he multiplied the loaves. A lot of people were following Jesus because he multiplied the fish. A lot of people were because he was healing people. And he's saying, listen, you should be following me because these miracles confirm that I have the power to forgive sin. And the communion puts everything back on, yes, there's benefits, there's healings when in partaking in his body and in his blood and abiding in the new covenant of faith. But the main thing is it means nothing. If you get out of a wheelchair and you end up in hell, what good did it do you? The whole thing is remembering that Jesus has taken away sin and in the new covenant given us eternal life. The fulfill what Jesus said in Ezekiel. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 said this, Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, or adulterers, or infamous, or abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, or extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were son of you. But you are washed, you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. If you read this scripture, he just fulfilled what he said he was going to do in Ezekiel. He said, I will cleanse you. Then you get in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He said, you were washed. How? By the Spirit of God. The Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is what washes you and cleanses you and make you perfect before God. Not because you did anything of yourself to make yourself perfect. You don't have the power to do it. Even if you try and stop sinning, you're still going to sin. It's because of what God placed inside of us. Romans 7 is about... Your flesh and your spirit always fighting against each other. They said, those things I know I should do, I find myself not doing. Those things I know I shouldn't do, those are the things I find myself doing. Then he says, who's going to deliver me from this body of death? The body of death is what? This flesh we live in. And he says, listen, with my mind, I always want to serve God, but my flesh is always going to want to serve sin. He said, then it's no longer I who's doing it, it's my flesh. But then he says, thank God that Jesus Christ is the one that gives us the victory in this. So it's all about Jesus Christ giving us the victory. Yeah, and the communion brings us back to what the Holy Spirit tells us in John 16, verse 9, that it's going to convict us of spiritual sin, not of fleshly sins. Jesus never went around and corrected one person of a fleshly sin. He was always pointing us back to the Father and correcting the Word of God so that we could have knowledge and understanding of the truth. And when we know the truth, the truth sets us free. The disciples also asked in John 6, verse 28 and 29, what are the true works of God? And that is to believe on him whom he has sent. There's been a big misconception that you have to 
somehow make yourself righteous or which is the biggest form of iniquity which was found in Satan, which is either I can or I can't. It's Jesus has done it all, and we come into remembrance of him. And also that he promises that we do this until he comes or returns. So it's supposed to be a celebration and a, and a, a memorial every time we come together, remembering that Jesus lives. You said it, that it's, you take communion in faith. You read in Hebrews 11, everyone who had received the promise saw afar off, and that was that was the faith that they had, which was that Jesus was coming, and that it says uh, in Galatians th- 2 or 3, I believe, that, you know, until faith came, you know, we had the tutor of the law. Faith came in Christ Jesus, and so when we do remember Christ in the communion table, we do take it in faith because we are acknowledging not only that once we are done here, we are going to be with him, but also that he is coming back for his church. We take communion because we know that we are in the flesh as we are now, but we see afar off and know and take it in faith that Christ has accomplished what he did, maybe, yeah, 2,000 years ago, but that we will still be taken home because he already sees us in heavenly places. So the faith is seeing it afar off, not that he he just finished the work 2,000 years ago, but he finished the work from the foundations of the world, and we know that he's coming back for us and that we have hope to make it home again. And one of the things I really want to talk about is if you take the Bible from beginning to end, then you'll never lose sight. First of all, you have to understand that Romans, Romans says the wages of sin is death. So if the wages of sin is death, the only price that can be paid for sin is death. So your behavior, your not sinning, is not going to pay the price for sin. But if you go to Leviticus 17, 11, it says the life of the flesh is in the blood, and it is the blood that makes an atonement for your soul. You go to Hebrews 9, 22, it says without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin. And if you go to Hebrews 9, 12, it says, neither by the blood of bulls and calves, but by his own blood, he entered once into the holy place, having attained eternal redemption for us. Now, if you understand that each one of these statements said there has to be bloodshed, so there has to be a death to pay the price of sin. Now, if we go back to Exodus chapter 12, when they got ready to be delivered out of Egypt, it says, take a lamb in your house on the 10th day, you kill it on the 14th day. That's like Jesus going into his ministry at 30 years old, and then just like the lamb three and a half days later, Jesus three and a half years later, Jesus goes as the Passover lamb, just like the Passover lamb in Exodus, and you kill that innocent animal. Jesus was innocent, hadn't done anything wrong, so just like that innocent animal in the book of Exodus, Jesus is crucified like that innocent animal was killed. And then God says what? He said, take the blood from that animal and put it on the lintel and the doorpost of your house. He said, it could be a token of the covenant between me and you. And this is why Jesus says, in his blood is what? The new covenant. And he says, when the deaf angel comes in, he didn't say when the deaf angel comes in, when he see a sin-free house, when he comes in and see a behavior right house, it didn't say in there, it said when the deaf angel sees the blood, that house will be bypassed. So it's always the blood that's going to make an atonement for the soul. And when we pass away and we die, finally die, leave this body, Death don't take hold on us because it sees the blood of Jesus that covers us. So it's all about the price being paid for sin has always been blood, bloodshed. If you go all the way back to Adam and Eve, when Adam and Eve fell, they covered themselves with fig leaves. That couldn't cover their sin. So by the time you read to the end of the chapter three, God kills an animal and covers them with animal skin, testifying that an animal or life has to be killed. Blood has to be shed in order to cover sin. So the, shit, the, the communion started with God killing the animal and covering Adam and Eve. And so if you carry that all the way through the Bible, everything going to show is Adam didn't cover his own sin. He tried with fig leaves. Didn't work. Just like Cain tried to bring fruits and vegetables. It didn't work. Abel brought a lamb and the fat thereof, killed the lamb, shed the blood, and that's why he accepted Abel's and didn't accept Cain. So when you go back all the way to the beginning, it has always been a life or death has to pay the price of sin. And when someone tells you your behavior is paying the price of sin, or you're trying to stop from sin as you paying the price of sin, that's impossible. You can't cover sin with your own works. Sin is covered by Jesus Christ in the blood that he shed. You see Christ from beginning to end. Jesus says that the whole book is written about him, the whole volume of it. And so 
even in such communion as in remembrance of him, and we can see it just as you said to Adam and Eve, we can see it in Exodus, and I just wanted to bring the example of another one. I mean, there are so many, even when you kill a heifer who's never been put to yoke before, things like that. You just you see communion in everything because all of it is pointing to communion in Christ Jesus, which is the finished work of God, and that that's what we're remembering. But Abraham met Melchizedek, and what did he do? He brought bread, broke it, and had the wine. All of it symbolizing what Jesus was coming to do, but the significance even in that, which is really cool, when he's doing it to Abraham, we know from Hebrews 7 that Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. So when Melchizedek was interacting with Abraham and by all means technically taking communion at that time, we understand that just as the Levites say paid tithes, through the loins of Abraham, we know that we also, as we take communion, take communion as sons of Abraham by faith, and in the same, we partake of the promises that were meant for Abraham or promised to Abraham, and we are that blessed portion of the world that God promised. This last night's sermon was on all the reasons why people leave church, and the only one that made any sense was they have questions and they're not being answered. Yeah. All the other ones, let me have church alone. It's like, it says, do not forsake the assembly of yourselves, especially as you see the day of the Lord approaching. And we know the day of the Lord is approaching because we can see all the signs pointing up to the time of Christ's return. We yeah. don't. No one knows the day or the hour, but we know the season, and the season's upon us. And we know that Jesus said, you cannot see the kingdom unless you're born again. And there's a big difference between having a born again experience and, and having a born again life. If you come together and you only do communion once a year, you may have a, an experience with God. You may get, come into remembrance where your sins are forgiven. But if you're doing this often and your focus is on Christ, blessed is the man whose mind is stayed upon the Lord. Hebrews 4, 16 says that we can run to the throne of God boldly and cry out, Abba, Father, in our time of need. And the moment we're rethinking, oh, man, I'm not worthy to take this. Yeah, that's why he chose the base things, the foolish things, and the weak things. And everyone was going, why are you hanging out with sinners and, and publicans? Because he came to save those that were lost, sick, and in need of a physician. Mm-hmm. And we're coming to him in our time of need, which is always, because you had mentioned who's going to deliver us from this body of death. And thank God, through Jesus, we're born again. He doesn't see us after our flesh. He sees us as a born again, born again bo- part of the body of Christ that's going to get a new glorified body. One thing that's never talked about is, even in the Old Covenant, if we were coming saying, I'm righteous, I can take these elements. In the Old Covenant, you had the sin of ignorance, even the sins you didn't even know about. And the best part was, even the high priest had to first make a sacrifice for himself before he could even make a sacrifice for the people, which I don't know why anyone would want to go around what Jesus has done. It's, It's a free gift of grace, not by any works that we have done, we just take it, and it's just like if you give someone a gift today, they go, why'd you give this to me? Oh, man, now i got to give you some. But if you give it to a child, they just rip it open and say thank you and immediately want to enjoy it with you. And I know that's why Jesus said, in order to come to the kingdom of heaven, you must come as this little child, Yeah, just in simple faith. But you have so many people talking about not tithing. You're not supposed to tithe. And if you go back to what Matt was saying a minute ago, and you understand Abraham, and we are the children of Abraham, and he met Melchizedek, and Jesus is the high priest after the order of Melchizedek, not the high priest of Aaron. He came after the order of Melchizedek. When Abraham met Melchizedek, the first thing Abraham did was, after they had communion, Melchizedek brought out the bread and the wine, then Abraham tithed 10% of everything he had. And you got a lot of the church world today, so you don't have to tithe. You don't have to tithe. Well, if you're the children of Abraham and Jesus is the high priest after the order of Melchizedek, how is it you don't have to tithe? The first thing Abraham did was tithe to Melchizedek. And if Jesus is the high priest after Melchizedek, not the high priest after the order of Aaron, he's the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So the first thing we have to do when we see Jesus is honor him by giving him what he said, the tithe is most holy to God. We have to tithe to Melchizedek. People will tell you, oh, I'm not giving my money to a pastor. I'm not giving. You're not giving your money to a pastor. You're giving your money to Jesus. Jesus is the one who asked you to tithe. God the one said, give a tithe. The pastor didn't tell you to tithe. The word tells you to tithe. 
And if you have no, if you don't have an understanding of what the tithe is, just read Numbers 18. It tells you the tithe, God said, the tithes come to me and I gave the tithe to Moses. The people didn't give tithe to Moses, God gave it to them. So many people are going to get lost because they don't understand what true worship is to God. And worship to God is giving God what he deserves. And this is why Jesus said, wherever the gospel is preached, all in the whole world tell what this woman did. She took the most precious thing she had and used it to anoint Jesus for his burial. She understood that even when the Pharisees and the disciples didn't understand who Jesus was and that she should give him that type of honor. And the reason people don't get anywhere is because preachers don't allow them to ask questions. People have questions about these things. And if you don't allow, are not allowed to ask questions in church, if you can't ask the preacher a question, a lot of preachers say, well, you have to let the Holy Spirit just, you can't uh, grieve the Holy Spirit. You got to let it flow. No, you don't want to answer the question because you don't have the answer. <laughs> you have to allow people to ask you questions. That is the only way people understand. If you ask someone to just take your word for it, Jesus didn't even just say, take my word for it. Jesus allowed that his disciples always went in the room. Jesus, what about this parable? Jesus, why are you speaking in parable? Jesus, why? Jesus answered questions. So, Sooner or later, people going to realize if I can't answer the question, if I can't get my answer, then I need to find a way to get my answer. And they go go look other places trying to find an answer. I really don't know why you're preaching if you don't have the answers. With the example of the woman giving her two mites. She had the mindset just like the woman that Jesus referred to as a dog, but she said even the dogs eat the crumbs from the master's table. It's a, a get to versus a have to. Mm. And because, because the devil has ministers of life, because there's been so much false teaching and false doctrine, I know I definitely had the mindset of they're just, why, what do they want my money for? I don't have nothing. Yeah. Versus when you give people the word of God and then God says in Malachi chapter 3, test me on this yeah. and see if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour you out such a blessing. And it wasn't, yes, there's, there's carnal uh, um, favor that comes with putting God first, but the blessing is building that relationship with Jesus Christ, getting to know Jesus and getting past the milk of the word getting to the meat of the word and the understanding of hearing his voice when he's speaking. And uh, you know why uh, the, tr the false church is preaching that, because people will give love offerings, they'll give partnership offerings, they'll give, just like it's Vegas, uh, to give to get something back. But when you truly give to God, and you, even if it's... The, the only time we get to the point where we're truly giving is when we give to our hurt, because then we're giving the way God gives. And that's when God can step in and be our provider when we get ourselves out of the way. And he usually has to bring a lot of us to that point before he can really give us what it is that he has for us. The woman who said that the dog, even the dogs eat from the crumbs of the master's table, I mean, this, this even goes along with the communion and how Christ is in everything, because obviously the crumbs being Christ breaking his body, you know, we take communion that way, but you got to remember something too what Jesus came for was he came for that which was lost and he came for the whole house of Israel i think people will just see her as a gentile cuz i mean that's who she was but you got to remember when Jesus says i've never seen such faith even in Israel Hebrews 12 says that he is the originator of faith so where did her faith even come from Clearly, it came from him, so he knows who he's coming for. There's a reason that she heard him, and there's a reason that she said that, and there's a reason she partook of the bread of the master's table, because she was of God's lost sheep. So if you partake of the communion table, if you partake of the tithe, you're acknowledging that you are his. And if you're not partaking of these things, what are you saying? We go to Genesis 6-4. The whole world is evil and wicked continuously. You get to Jeremiah 17, I think it's verse 9, where it says, who can search the, the, the mind and the heart? It's just evil and wicked and corrupt. And, you know, Romans 3, 10 says, there's none righteous, no, not one, and none even seek after God. So when we say, I found Jesus, and Jesus said, you didn't choose me, but I chose you and ordained you. And that you should bear much fruit, your fruit should remain. And the only way we're going to bear fruit is if we stay connected to him. And so the communion is such an essential part with that because that's exactly what it is. Communion, it's a relationship, mm. an ongoing conversation and uh, closeness with, with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. People still don't have totality of who Jesus was and why he came. Because if you really understand the Bible, you have to understand, I'm going to say this, First Peter says that Jesus, First Peter says that Jesus bore our sins in his body. 
And if he bore our sins in his body, our sins, what did he leave us to bear? And then when you read Isaiah 53, not only did he get wounded for our transgression and bruised for our iniquities, it says God laid on him the iniquity of us all. So all of our iniquity was laid on Jesus just like you laid it on the scapegoat. All our sins were laid on Jesus just like you did with the Passover lamb. And then Jesus came and fulfilled the function of the scapegoat and the Passover lamb. And when you start to understand what 2 Timothy chapter 2 says, said Jesus abolished death. Death means put an end to it. Or well, I mean abolished means he put an end to it. And then when you go to Ephesians, it says he abolished the law and the commandments. I'm going to read that before I say then if he abolished the law and the commandments and sin is transgression of the law, when you read that in 1 John, and Romans says where there is no law, there can be no transgression. So when you understand what he's saying, how is it that we could think that we could take glory and not sinning when Jesus gets all the glory because he took us, took us from under the law so that we cannot be held accountable to sin. Now, when you go to Ephesians chapter two, verse 13 says this, but now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes was the fall off are made near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who has made both one has broken down the middle wall of petition between us having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law commandments contained in ordinances, for to make of himself of two one new man, so making peace, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Jesus did everything. Jesus accomplished it, it all. And then when the church put it back on you, then that means you don't believe what Jesus said that he came to do. You don't yep. believe what God sent him to do. The Bible says he came to save his people from their sins. Why? Because the Bible says with the law came sin. He said everybody became guilty with the law. He said the law came to make the whole world guilty. So if the law came to make you guilty, how else are you going to be saved? Other than Jesus had to come and do what? Pay the price for sin. So the law made everybody guilty. And the Bible says there's, there's none good, no, not one. He said for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everybody. So how is it possible that you can stop sinning on your own? It can't be. It can't happen. All the glory and praise goes to God for sending his son and goes to Jesus for being willing to fulfill the will of the Father to come down and pay the final price for sin, which is the sacrifice of himself. My head went to so many different places, like, oh, like, oh, great, you know, with what you just said, you can go to this scripture, like Romans 8, 3, abolish the sin in the flesh, and, uh, and then it just went everywhere. But if you if you can't read the Bible and see that, all of it's saying the exact same thing, uh, that you may not be looking for truth. You may be just scripture pulling and looking for what you want. I, it's it. God says, I, I love, Isaiah is so funny to me. The whole book of Isaiah is, I mean, there's so much to it, but God is just continuously saying, I will not share my glory. And then you see people continue to try to share his glory, like, thank you, Jesus, you saved me. Now I will keep the commandments. Dude, Read Colossians, read Romans 3 and 4. Read, just, you know what? Don't Just open the Bible in the first place. Let's start there. Because the whole book is about... Actually, you started the message with this. You started this podcast with this. I will sanctify my great name. And that whole Ezekiel 36 is, I will, I will, I will. There is, Jesus says, there is nothing you can do apart from me. So if you're trying to do works or good works, you need to acknowledge what good works are. Jesus says that, what was it, John 6, 29? Where he says the work of God is to believe. Okay, so good work. Good in the ancient Hebrew just means functional. Belief? What's belief? It's the work of God is to be functional. <laughs> if you believe in him, like Colossians 1, 10, 11 says, says be fruitful in every good work. Good work is a functional belief. If you believe what he says, you will go and do what he says, and God is a big farmer. <laughs> he's a, he's a, he's, his thumb is extremely green. He has planted the wheats, and he's going to retrieve the wheats, and he's going to cut off the tares and go where they may go. But that's not concerning us, those who truly believe. You got to understand that God is the one who plants. Uh, well, we plant, we water, but even at such... He works that through us. But God is always the one who gives the increase. God is the only one who deserves the glory because when he says he calls the, the broken, when you are really broken and you know it, you can't stand up. 
you are beaten. You are just in the corner of, uh, you're between, you know, in the corner. You're just in the corner. I don't know. Pick a wall. <laughs> you're beaten down. You can't stand up. You have been beaten down by Satan. And Jesus came to bound the strong man, take back what's his, and there's nothing you can do except take communion with thanks because you acknowledge that he did what he said he would do and only to him belongs the glory for it. If you understand, Paul says something very profound in Romans 4. And matter of fact, I'm going to read that. I wasn't going to read it, but I want to read it. In Romans 4, starting in verse 1, he says, What shall we say then that Abraham, my father, is pertaining to the flesh is found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has whereof to glory, but not before God. What says the scriptures? Abraham believed God and was counted to him for righteousness. Now to him that works is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But him that works not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David described the blessings of a man unto whom the Lord imputed righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they who iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord will not impute sin. That means God will not hold sin against you even though you fall short. This is why 1 John said, if you do fall short, confess it, and God will clean your slate as, as white as snow, and you're righteous before God. So when you start to understand, this is why the gospel is called good news. The church make good news out of bad news. Mm -hmm. People come in, they're broken. People come <clears> in and because they did so many bad things in their life, and they come into church, and they're like, man, I look, I'm looking for Jesus. I'm looking a way out of this. And then the pastor comes in and says, well, you want to believe in Jesus? You want to give your life to Jesus? And you say, yeah, and you're hoping for the, the salvation coming in Christ. And then he gets you and tell you, put you on the law and tell you to go back to work. And then you actually end up in the same place you started at. Now you're getting beat up worse because every time you fall short in the law, then it's like, well, what can I do? I might well have stayed in the world. And then they go back to the world. But when you tell people the good news is, lesson, Jesus Christ covers your sin. Anything you did in the past is covered. Because you become a new creature in Christ. And anything you did in the future, he's covered that also. That's why he says his redemption is eternal. And when you start to understand that, then you can walk free in Christ, not free to serve you, but free to serve him. And now you can serve him 100% to your fullest ability without worrying about, did I fall here? If you walk in love, you will not fall. You will not fail if you walk in love. Yeah, I, there was a few things, I uh, won't go into it, you know, of course... John 1, Jesus becoming flesh, you gave us that revelation. And then you've also given us uh, one where in, in Leviticus 17, 11, that the life of the flesh is in the blood, and the blood carries breath, oxygen. And without his spirit, we can do nothing. And then the other part is, is such a revelation is in 1 John where he's saying, those who are in Christ cannot sin. And coming to the communion table you're not asking God for forgiveness anymore. You're actually thanking him. Yeah. So when you fall short, when your mind has truly been transformed and the blood of Jesus, like Hebrews 9 says, has finally cleansed your conscience of sin, you're actually coming to God. That's why it's a memorial, a celebration of a person, time, and event where you're saying, Jesus has done it. And people think you should be beating yourself down, but you've already, you may have already gotten on your knees and said, Lord, I fell short. Thank you for giving me the ability to stand and walk in grace and have faith in you and be obedient to you and preach the gospel and go and love my brother or my sister as you continue to love me and saying thank you rather than coming and saying please, please, please. He has made us sons of God, kings and priests, and is preparing a place for us. And the communion is the, the reminder, again, of all that he's done rather than coming in, oh, I've, uh, you know, I need this. Your, your flesh is a suitcase that carries the Holy Spirit. And it's, yeah. it's, that's why the life of the flesh is in the blood. Thank you, Jesus. You start to look at Abraham. He said, Abraham believed God, and God accounted to him for righteousness. He didn't say Abraham worked, and God accounted. He believed what God said. So let's talk about the gospel. He says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Faith in what? The gospel. Jesus came and preach the gospel of the kingdom. And when Jesus died and left, he left a mission. He said, go and preach this gospel in the whole world. Whoever believes will be saved and have eternal life. Whoever don't believe will have damnation. So the message is, do you believe that Jesus covered all your sins, past, present, and future? 
Do you believe that Jesus made you righteous before God, even in this carnal flesh? That's what you have to, that's what pleased God is believing that. You have to believe what God said. You can't go through here and God says, listen, ask yourself this question. Why would God send his son into the world to die, to shed his blood, and you still got to stop sinning? And what I mean by that, it all means purposely going out, purposely saying I'm going to sin. I mean that all the things you done fell short in, and then God sent his son, put your sins, your iniquities on him, Jesus get beaten, unrecognizable, hung on a cross, and then you say, well, he did all of that, so let me stop sinning because I can glory in myself that I stopped sinning. What glory does Jesus get? Right there. <laughs> I mean, the glory goes to Jesus because he covered everything that I couldn't do. That's why he gets the praise. That's why he gets the glory. And I'm going to say this, Matt, real quick. Go for it. And this is why I say people got a problem when they go to church and they start telling all these reasons why they don't go to church no more. Mm -hmm. None of those reasons are why you come to church. You come to church to hear from God, to get a word from God. You come to church to be perfected for the work of ministry so that you can God can send you out into the world to do the same thing he sent Jesus out to. Yeah. But you can't get sent out if you don't have an understanding of the word. So God said, come into the church, that's where you get perfected at, mm -hmm. and that you're no longer tossed to and fro by all these different doctrines out there. That's why you see some Christians that say, oh, I believe in this, but I also like the Muslim religion. I also like what uh, uh, the black Israelites are saying. I also like what uh, these people are saying. No, when you understand the word of God, you're not going to get tossed by anything they say because the foundation of the gospel is Jesus Christ. And you can't get twisted on anything else. If they don't bring Jesus, it's not true. Meaning construction as well. Foundation's off. Whole house is going to crumble. You got to start over. It's so simple. And we keep coming back to the same thing. Like, let's just say for what it is. If, if you're saying, you know, you can't take this if you're a sinner or whatever. Like, okay, well, what, what is sin now? We've already talked about that sin has been done away with in the flesh. Romans 14.23 just says, whatever, anything... Put a box around that. <laughs> is whatever that is, anything that is not of faith is sin. So when you take communion, your faith is that he has completed it. That this is the reconciliation through his blood, the atonement for your soul, the price paid for the original fall under Adam. You read Romans 5 and it tells you, like you said, you, you don't do sins. I mean, you can transgress the law, and in which case, yes, those are sins, but you are born a sinner. It says anyone who is born of Adam in this flesh sins because they are born of the fallen state of man. But that's why you have to be born again into the Spirit. And it really just comes down to when you take communion, do you believe that? I think one of the problems that people have in church is because they have no understanding in the Bible that when Jesus came on the scene, Jesus was walking under the old covenant. Mm. And they call Mark, Matthew, John, and Luke. They still call it the New Testament, but it was the old covenant. Jesus is walking under the old covenant. And it is not until his death at the end of each one of these books that the new covenant come into effect. So if you think Jesus, that's why people keep saying, well, Jesus, let's go back. I don't want to hear Paul. Let's go back and read what Jesus said. Jesus was fulfilling the old covenant so he can bring in a new covenant. And if you don't understand that, then people are still trying to walk under the old covenant and also walk under the new covenant at the same time. But if you understand what the new covenant, I'm going to read the new covenant right now. If you understand what the new covenant says, then you have a full understanding of what God is trying to get us to see. I'm going to read from Hebrews 8, 7. It says, for if the first covenant had been faultless, then there should be no place have been sought for a second covenant. For finding fault with them, he didn't find fault with the covenant, he found fault with them. He said, Behold, the days come, said the Lord, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with them in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, said the Lord. So God is telling you that covenant that I gave with Moses coming off the mountain, he says, they didn't even keep that covenant, but I'm going to give them a new covenant. Then he tells you what the new covenant is, verse 10. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write it in their hearts, and I will be to them a God that shall be to me a people. And this is why people think, well, you got to keep the law. No, he tells you he's writing it in your heart with his spirit. What is his spirit? Love. So with love, you're going to walk in these things without even trying because you're going to love your brothers and love your sisters. 
He said, they shall not teach every man his neighbor, every man his brother, saying to know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest. I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, their sins and iniquities. I will remember no more. God is not going to remember your sins and iniquities no more. This is why the communion table is so important to take and understand. When you pick up that cup and say, this is the new covenant in his blood, that is the new covenant. He's not remembering your sins and iniquities anymore. And when you take that cup, you got to take that in faith that he's not remembering them. You can't take it and then turn around and say, well, I got to go stop sinning or start crying about your sins because that means you don't believe that he took care of them and he's not remembering them anymore. But God is not remembering your sins and iniquities anymore if you stand in faith whenever you take this communion. And this is why you have to do it often because if you don't do it often, you can start forgetting. You can start following something else. But every time you come together, if you understand that communion table, it will keep you in faith. That's why... Um you go back and there's so many places where like when they cross the Jordan, okay, now you cross it over, set up 12 unhewn stones as a memorial. God is constant. I mean, there was a memorial of two stones on the high priest's shoulders. And when you understand what that means, obviously Christ bringing in government on his shoulders, but also there's more than one fold. It's not just the Jews. It's all of Israel. So it's even the ones that are out in the Gentile nations when he ends up coming back. But I was just going to bring this to when Jesus says he does it all. This is a new covenant to fulfill the promise that he made to Abraham. Again, you could see the same thing throughout the entire Bible. The reason that he had to put Abraham to sleep was because he would be the one who fulfills his end of the promise and his end of the promise. The promise is going to come to anyone who chooses to accept it because he was the one who made it and he was the one who fulfilled it. So he was put to sleep. And Jesus and God walk through the center of that covenant. And that's why, again, you say we see Jesus in Romans, what is it, 3, that he has the brass feet. It's because he walked through the furnace, which was hell. He brought our sins down there and left them there. Read Leviticus 16, and you understand, or Leviticus 6, uh, scapegoat and the understanding of the sacrifices. There is a reason that he, in Revelation, looks the way he was, but I'm sure that's for another time. I'm just talking about he was the one who walked through the furnace and the lamp, walked through the covenant pieces together, and why Abraham was asleep, even though the promise was to Abraham. People really don't understand. And one of the things I was told long ago is if you really have a misunderstanding of the Bible, if you really want to see it in context, you go to Romans 3. And I'm going to read something from Romans 3, and I'm going to break it down. Starting at Romans 3, verse number 23. He said, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If you put that in context, it's saying we had no hope. If we all came short of the glory, there was no hope. There was no way out. Then he says, but being justified freely by his grace through the redemption. Redemption means price paid that is in Christ Jesus. We have hope whom God set forth to be a propitiation. That means a place of mercy through affliction. And it also means atoning for sin through faith. That means a state of mind without doubt in his blood, faith in his blood. This is why when you read Isaiah, it said it pleased God to bruise Jesus that way. God was letting us know it wasn't the Romans that was bruising Jesus. It was him. Mm -hmm. And he said, why was God bruising Jesus that way? Because all the sins of mankind was put on Jesus. All the iniquities of mankind was put on Jesus, and God was beating Jesus as the sacrificial lamb for the sins of all mankind. And it pleased God to do that because it wasn't Jesus he was beating on. It was just flesh he was beating on. And when he beat Jesus and Jesus sat on the cross for that long, Jesus became that place of mercy for us, that place of refuge that we can run to. And he said to declare or to prove his righteousness for the remission, which means the passing over, or letting go unpunished of sins previously done from the beginning of creation till now through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believes in Jesus, which believe in Jesus. The message is, do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe in what Jesus came for? Now, let's talk about church. People think they come to church to be entertained. Well, I went to church and yeah, I didn't feel nothing. Or they come in and say, well, I had a need. I went to church to get a need. Show me anywhere in the Bible that they went to the temple to get a need. You went to the temple to bring something to God. And God said, do not show up here empty. 
Every time you went there, you went there to take something to God. Why? Because God was blessing you. And this is why the church is such a ray is because of so many people sick, just like the day when Jesus showed up. The reason everybody was sick, everybody was in such an array was because they didn't have God anymore. They still had a temple. Everybody was still there, but you had sick people. You had a man lying by the pool for 38 years sick. One would have issue of blood for 12 years sick. You had a blind man sick. Nobody was getting healed. Nobody was getting anything from God because even though they had a temple, even though everybody was going to the temple, but nobody was getting anything covered. They weren't doing sacrifice to the sacrificing. They were merchandising in and out of the temple. The same thing a lot of churches do. So until we realize why we go in the church and the communion table should be the start of every church to remind you why you're there. You are there to worship God, to hear from God, and to thank God. In everything that you do, you are there for those reasons. And if you're going there to be entertained, you're going for the wrong reason. You're going there because they got babysitters, you're the wrong reason. You're going there for coffee, you're going there for the wrong reason. If you're going there because you love the band, you're going there for the wrong reason. If you're going there because the church is beautiful, you're going there for the wrong reason. You go to church because of what God and Jesus Christ has done for us. And the communion table tells us clearly what he's done. And you cannot get around Jesus and the communion table because that is the foundation that we stand on. And that's what the gospel is built on. The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ came and did everything for us. So we can now serve God to the fullest and we can worship our Father, we can praise Him, we can glorify Him, and we can say, we can tell the whole world how great He is. I just wanted to bring it back to that. What, what are you saying about church and not coffee? What is it? People coffee. coming to church for the wrong reasons. Some coming for coffee, some oh, coming yeah, for... Yeah, but my question is, what's wrong with the coffee? <laughs> <laughs> Coffee's pretty good. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> well, coffee might be pretty good, but that ain't why you go in there. Yeah. But this is what happens when you, when you start to put in all these auxiliary programs, and people start going to church for the wrong reason. They start to go like, "Well, I'm going because my son sings in the choir. I'm going because of oh, yeah. oh the coffee. They oh, get the coffee is great. I'm going because of the, the all these different reasons why they're going to church, and none of them are the right reason. Yeah, in New Jersey, it's the bagels." The bagels and the coffee. You know, I keep hearing the Spirit say what he's done, what he's done. And if you don't have Christ, this won't make sense. But those who have Christ will understand this. He's tasted death for every man. Yes. And death, we're all going to die a physical death. Every graveyard on the planet proves that. But death by definition meaning separation from God. Yeah. And that eternal relationship will never break. That's why to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And... We're not going into Abraham's bosom. We're going to be directly in his kingdom. And they, they asked, Jesus asked two different occasions, why are you seeking me? Why are you following me? And it says, if we eat of his body, we will never hunger. If we drink of his blood, or he is the living water, we'll never thirst. And uh, one of, I'm sure you'll elaborate on it, but it, why are we seeking him? And if we're still hungry spiritually, and if we're still thirsty spiritually, we have to check our motivation. Are we truly wanting God? Are we truly wanting to be delivered from the separation from God? That Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and the only way to the Father. And he makes us not only brings us into the kingdom, but he makes us one with him, making us a part of his body. In the same way he says, I'm one with the Father, I'm making you one with me. And you, I, I, I can't even comprehend. The eyes have not seen, ears have not heard of what God has in stores for those who love him. But Jesus is literally saying, I'm not, it's God, Jesus, and then, you know, you got every little place he's saying, no, we're all going to be one. This is, this is why God deserves the glory, though, because he has literally taken dust. This is why the it's angels terrible. say, what is man that you're so mindful of him? It's because he has taken dust and made dust gods, co-heirs with Christ, Jesus. Listen, if you were a god, would you... Would you deify anybody else to your be level? Here. Granted, <laughs> you know, all in all, we'll be placed under God's feet, but yeah. he literally, Christ did all the work, and he said, yeah. you'll be co-heirs with him. How can, listen, we're going to take, God's going to give us a crown, and we're going to take it off, and we're going to hit our face so hard, our spiritual face, whatever this looks like, <laughs> and just drop that crown at his feet, because he deserves all the glory. And when we say he deserves it, I mean, it's one thing to understand. Is Let's say you're a drug addict or something. You feel trapped in this body. To some extent, well, to every extent, everyone is trapped in this body. And Jesus chose from where he was to come into this prison yeah. 
Yeah. And on top of that, like you said, taste death for every man. And that's why I want to bring it back to the communion. When you realize that Jesus was bruised for all of our sin, all of our iniquity, what was that, Isaiah 53? You realize that that doesn't mean, he says all, that doesn't mean like the sin you did yesterday uh, and that tomorrow's sin. When Whenever you sin next, you understand it was paid for and beaten, Jesus was beaten for that one as well at the cross. It was finished. Now I want you to think, I want to go back to something Sean said. When Jesus said, I am the bread of life, two things that Jesus said, and I, and I think people really need to understand this. When he said, I'm the bread of life, a lot of people think like the children of Israel, they got the manna and they was like, well, our father gave us manna. Jesus said, they ate that manna and they are dead. So the bread, what is bread? Bread is sustenance that you need to live off of. What is water? It is what you need without food, without water, you cannot live. So Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. Is he talking about our carnal fleshly life? No, because the Bible said God is a spirit. Then it says Jesus raised up from the grave being a life-giving spirit. And it says that Jesus said, hey, the Father has life within himself. And he's gave the Son to have life in himself. Jesus said, I lay down my life that I can take it back again. Jesus is showing you what life is. So by being the bread of life, he's saying, I'm the sustenance of that spiritual life. And if you eat my words or you hear my words, your spirit is going to live. If you accept me into your life, the word of God, you accept me into your life, I'm going to give you the sustenance of life so you can continue to live after your flesh dies. But then he's also said, any man that comes to me shall never thirst. What he's talking about, he says, out of his belly will flow rivers of, rivers of living water. And he said, those rivers of living water was the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit becomes the water that we can't live without. And this is why Jesus said in Hebrews, if any man has partaken of the spirit of the world to come, if he turn away from that, he can't be redeemed. So if you understand, Jesus has everything we need to live. It came from him. He's the bread of life and he's the living water. And the blood. And those two things, and he shed his blood in that communion table to be able to become the bread of life and give us the living water mm -hmm. so that we can, we'll never die. We're going to take our last breath in this body. But the shell comes off. This is why 1 Corinthians 15 is so important. He said, this corruptible must put on incorruption. But the only time it does that, he says, when it's sown into the ground, it's sown in natural man, it's raised a spiritual man. It's sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It's sown as a mortal, it raises immortality. See, the only time you can become immortal, the only time you can become sin-free is when you die and come up out of that grave. All the time before that, you're still going to be corruptible until you die and take your last breath. And the moment you take your last breath, you're not corruptible anymore. You raise it up, you raise up, and you become the very, very child of God. And join, like Matt said, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. I mean, think about how awesome that is. Think about how great a message that is. That, like Matt said, God took a piece of clay, formed it into a man. And this is what people need to understand. That piece of dirt was there with no animation in it. It was there doing nothing but laying there like a shell until God blew the breath of life in there. What did he blow into that? Himself, because he is life. And then man became a living soul. So even in itself for getting up, man thinking he has the power to do anything, he can't do anything until God plucked the breath of life in him. When he dies, what comes out of him? The breath of life out of him. Where does it go? It depends on whether you understand the communion table and your belief in Jesus Christ is going to be the determining factor. This is why we celebrate Jesus. This is why we love Jesus. This is why we praise Jesus. This is why there's nothing that's going to turn us away from Jesus. It's because we have a full understanding of what his body, his blood accomplished in God and what God has prepared for us being joint heirs with Christ. If that's not good news to you, I don't know what is. If you want to go to church and see a pastor dance and entertain you, you do so if that's what you want. I don't go to church for that. I go to church to hear from Jesus and to praise Jesus and to worship Jesus and to thank Jesus for what he did. Because if he hadn't have done it, I would never be reconciled back to my father. And this is all about Jesus Christ it has nothing to do with a man. This has everything, all the glory, all the praise, all the honor goes to God and Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in Ephesians to be filled with all the fullness of God. And the Greek word there for filled means a continuous filling. And that's why we need that constant connection, that constant connection where we're abiding in him and we're not just getting from him. 
Um, and the um, pastor had said something um, uh, about how tithes and offerings and communion, they tie in together. Because you're, you're starting off remembering that it begins with Jesus and ends with Jesus. And we're going to get the crown. And when we take this in faith of what he's done, you get filled. And then you get rewarded for your faith. You get jewels in your crown. And Matt said, you know, we're going to give that crown back to him. And going back to the tithe, that says, don't come before me empty-handed. Yeah. And so the mindset here is, why would you not want the gift of something strengthening you? It says his body is strength for the journey. His blood cleanses your conscience. When you do this, it builds your faith. And so all these things strengthen us to serve him. And in the Greek, again, slaves, there's no form of slavery. It means to be a slave without any form of slavery. And we're doing this willingly because he first loved us. So therefore, our organic response is, we love you. And yeah, if you're, if you're getting a version of Jesus, if you're getting a watered-down version of Jesus, or if you're getting uh, Jesus with stipulations, yeah, you're going to be hungry and you're going to be thirsty. And you're probably going to be even worse because now you don't even have hope to grab for something. And that's why in the world you see people, they may be down and out on the street corner. They could be with a needle in their arm or they could be in a penthouse that they landed a helicopter on, you know, and they're all doing the same thing. They all, they're all miserable. They all taste, they all basically saying, you're trying to get here and I'm trying to get there and everybody's just passing by and no one is satisfied because this flesh is never satisfied. But God's not coming to satisfy our flesh. He's coming to fill that God-shaped hole in every man's spirit that only Jesus can fill. And that is a continuous filling. You, and the, you had mentioned something before about rivers of living waters. That's why you want that constant connection to do this as often as you can. Because what would you rather have? You're a water guy, healthy water guy. Stagnant water or fresh water? You want fresh water. Water that's running is alive. And so Jesus is not dead. That's the whole thing about the communion. Yes, we remember one of the blessings that he doesn't remember our sins anymore, never even brings them into remembrance, that he's taken away iniquity, he's healed us of our diseases, all these things. By, the stripe, by his stripes, we were healed. I'm glad Sean said something very powerful. I don't know whether anybody caught that, whether he caught it, but Sean says, um, no, he said something very powerful. You have to understand this. The Bible says... Don't store up treasures here on the earth. Store up treasures in heaven. Okay, people don't understand that when you pay tithes, you store up treasures in heaven. When you preach the gospel, you store up treasures in heaven. Anytime you do anything for God, you store up treasures in heaven. Parable of talents. He gave talents to everybody. The one five, one two, one one. And when he came back to retrieve the one with five talents, the master, I gained five more talents and gave him back ten. The one that had two talents came back and said, I'll double what you gave me, and I gave him back four. The one with one talent said, oh, I know you're a hard man, so he buried it in the ground. He had nothing to give him. And this is what I want you to see and what Sean just said is if you haven't stored up any treasures in heaven, what are you going to give Jesus when you get to heaven when he says, don't show up before me empty-handed? That's why we take our crowns off and lay it at his feet. This is why we lay our crowns at his feet, because what else do we have to bring? We have nothing else to bring. When you die in this body, ain't nothing on this body you will take with you. The yeah. only thing you have with you is the crown he gives you. Yeah, amen. And you have nothing to give back to him when you show up in front of him. You'll be empty-handed if you didn't do anything for him. If you don't have no, when you get rewarded, why do you think you get rewarded at the uh, judgment seat of Christ? You don't go to the great white throne judgment. You get rewarded at the great at the judgment seat of Christ. He gives you according to what you did for him while you was here on earth. If you got nothing, you're like the labor that has nothing to give back to him. So when he gives you that crown, I want people to understand how powerful it is. You got to have something to lay at his feet. Mm -hmm. And if you have nothing to lay at his feet, then because you thought church was a time to just go and be entertained. You thought it was something to make you get a feeling not understanding that you were supposed to be going there to worship and praise him. You're supposed to be going there to figure out how can I do the works of God? What is it that God called me for? What did he bring me into this world for? Who do he want me to speak to? Who do he want me to give the gospel to? Who do he want me to get filled with the Holy Spirit? There's something he has for you to do in your circle of life. And you have to figure that out. 
and go to God. And that's why you come to church to find out what it is that God is trying to pull out of you. Not going in trying to push your idea through a church. You go there and find out what God is trying to tell you and what God needs from you. And when you understand the communion table that he did all of this for you, you have nothing to do but give him praise and worship. Brady, you said one thing. You said, why are some people still hungry? Why are some people still thirsty? I lost my train of thought at the very end there. It was, you got to get the Jesus that rose from the grave. You got to know the resurrected Jesus. A lot of times, even at the communion, you know, if you were raised up in the Catholic Church or things, it's, it, yes, we, we talk about his death because he died in our place, but you cannot neglect and you cannot leave out and just have that relationship with the Jesus that walked the earth. It's the one that rose up out of the grave and became a life-giving spirit and we've, if you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, you've already received that life. All we're doing is if we had is bread or juice or wine is basically remembering that he dwells within us. Ours is the only faith whose God has come down in mortal body, taking punishment in our place, dying, and then raising from the grave, and then putting the same spirit that raised him from the grave in his body of believers. You got to think about this. Why are people sick? Why are people? Let's go back to Jesus showing up in Jerusalem. They had a temple. Uh, it was the temple of God. But when Jesus showed up there, it was so many people sick and so many people diseased. Who are the ones who he was hit that was healed, getting healed? Was it the Pharisees? Or was it the religious leaders of the day? Was it the Sadducees? Was it the scribes? It was the common people that was looking for hope. And when, what did the word of God say? When you obey me and accept me and do what I say, God said, I take sickness away from among you. When the woman with the issue of blood, she said, let me just get through the crowd to just hold on to the hem of his garment. She got healed. Why? Because she was searching for Jesus. These other people just running, the Pharisees had their own little religion going on, had nothing to do with God. How are you going to get healed in that? That's why, that's why I'm saying what I'm saying. If you don't understand the communion table, if you don't understand why you're at church, then you say, well, why are so many people like this? Why are so many people like that? Because they don't have a full understanding of who Jesus is and who God is. God words stand if you know who he is and you believe what he said. You can't just go to church because or look at church in a way, well, I, I don't feel like going today, but I'll go to a basketball game. Then you say, and when God had told you, he wants preeminence. He wants to be first in your life. You can't keep putting these other things in front of God and then expect that to be the person walking around totally healed, totally happy, totally all. You can't be if he ain't first, first in your life. God has to be number one in your life before everything. That's what he's looking for. That's what he expects. And why wouldn't he expect that? He's God. He's the one who gave you the breath of life. If he gave you nothing else in this life, you should be thankful that he gave you the breath of life. But people can't even appreciate him for that. If I don't get something material, I'm mad at God. If God don't make me feel good, I'm mad at God. If I went to the church and didn't get my knees filled, I'm mad at God. You're, what it is, you're ungrateful because you don't know who he is and you have no idea what he's done for you. This is why Jesus came to the Jews and Jesus, what did Jesus say to the Jews? He said, I wish I could have gathered you under my wings like a hen gathered her chick, but you wouldn't have none of it. And Jesus also told him, listen, you missed the time of your visitation. So many people go miss the time of their visitation with Christ because they are looking for the wrong Jesus. Somebody and taught them the wrong Jesus. You got to understand the Jesus of this Bible. The one Sean said, you got to understand the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You got to understand the Jesus that God of the either Abraham and Jacob sent into the earth. You got to understand the Jesus that came from the seed of David, from the seed of Abraham, from the seed of Jesse. You have to understand who that Jesus is and why he came here and what he came here to accomplish and what do we get from what he accomplished. All you can get out of that is, God, I'm thankful. God, I praise you. God, I bow my face to the ground for you. If you don't get that out of it, something's wrong. You, you have a misunderstanding of who Jesus is. When Jesus came, and I was talking about that, all the Pharisees, the only one you really seen get healed was Paul. But this is what people don't understand when they start looking for a healing. Think about this. God says, the cardinal mind is enmity against me. The cardinal mind cannot please God. We keep looking at God for a physical healing, 
when God has healed us spiritually. The, the, the healing is what Adam caused in the garden. The sickness came in the garden. That's what God came to heal. He heals us physically, but why does he heal us physically? Listen what he tells the man that caught with palsy. He says, that he says, your sins are forgiven you. And they say, oh, nobody can forgive sin but God. And Jesus perceived their thoughts, and Jesus said this. Jesus says, what's easier for me to say? Your sins are forgiven you or take up your bed and walk? He said that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sin. What is forgiving sin? Forgiveness of our sickness. I'm going to heal you spiritually so that you can know I can heal you spiritually. He says, take up your bed and walk. And by that, they are supposed to see that he can forgive sin on earth. And they yeah. still don't see it. He told them, I can tell you forgive your sins, but I'm going to tell you to take up your bed and walk so that they'll know that I got power on earth to forgive sin. And then he tells us in the book of John, he says, he blew the Holy Spirit on them. And they received the Holy Spirit. Then he said, go into all the world and do what? He said, give them the gospel. Those who believe, he said, their sins are remitted. Those who don't believe, they retain their sins. So the message is retaining sin or remitting sin. And everywhere you go, if they receive Jesus, the sins are covered. They don't receive Jesus, they're still in their sins. So the healing process is we're healed spiritually more important than being healed physically. And this is why the 10 lepers are so important. Mm -hmm. 10 of them got healed. Nine walked away and didn't come back. The one that came back, Jesus said, you are made whole. But the other nine didn't get made whole. What means? They're going to live their life. They're not going to have leprosy, but they're going to die and they're going to go to hell. But the one that came back, he got healed physically and spiritually. Yeah. The key is that he has healed you spiritually. If you never get a healing, it doesn't matter. You're healed spiritually. The first miracle in Mark 16, these signs will follow those who believe. And then we think those signs are confirming the miracle that you believed and you yeah. heard the gospel. <laughs> ah, yeah. That's so funny. And, and actually right here on Santa Monica, right here in Hollywood, there was a man laying on the floor and I thought we he I thought he was gone. He like seemed like he owed overdose and we were like shaking him, getting ready to call the uh, ambulance or whatever and we're like, "Oh man, this this dude's in bad shape." Everything that Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will bring to remembrance. So, we just said, "Jesus." The guy popped up. "Hey, how's it going? You want to pray?" And like Sobered up, it was the craziest thing. And the same thing here, right here on Santa Monica. So I'm like, man, I'm going to do that when I can't get someone's attention to see if they're one of Jesus' sheep. Yeah, Give them the gospel. Go. And I, I was running around just like Brady and giving people the gospel, the good news. I just couldn't contain it. And there was a guy across the street right before uh, Highland on Santa Monica. And I just, he, I was going, hey, trying to get his attention to see if I could go over and talk with him. He wasn't answering. He wouldn't hear him. He couldn't, he, you know, wouldn't acknowledge me. So I went, Jesus. And he turned and looked right at me. So I got excited. I ran across the street to go see him. And then I was talking really fast like I am now to give him the <laughs> gospel. And he goes, sign language, slow down. I'm deaf. And I was like, what just happened here? And then I said, can I pray for you? And he goes, no, I'm okay. And it was, a, it was to show me. Whether he, he, whether he hears or not, he hears the voice of Christ. He hears the voice of Jesus. And those of us who can hear his voice when he speaks and see what it is that he's revealing to us, that is the miracle. The others are just for some of us, like the child that was born blind from birth. Why did this happen? Why? So not only could he be believing, but also he was going to go into the temple and convict everyone that says that Jesus isn't the Christ. And sometimes God will use us in that manner for his glory. But if he oh, doesn't, man. it doesn't matter. It matters is if you hear his voice and you love it enough to where you keep chasing more and more of it to build that relationship with him and then help build that relationship with others. Yeah, with that, I want to go back to the man with leprosy, or the, the nine, ten men with leprosy, nine left, one came back. Jesus said something. If you read it, he says, go and show yourselves onto the priest. Yeah. Why did one return? He acknowledged who the priest was. Yeah. They all ran and thought they were running to the priest, but the one who heals you is supposed to be the priest. In the in the Hebrew picture language, the word priest is kind of like, I mean, it's it's a picture of a hand and a seed, and it's supposed to 
mean like break open the head because that's how you get the seeds. So the priest was the one who's supposed to be at the base, like the threshing floor that breaks open the the wheat head to to show the seed. And that's that's the that's well, I should say, that's the first part of the healing. But Jesus did it in the order, obviously, of you know at that time to show like, look, your sins are remitted, that you're you're healed, right? And then so people could see it. They were healed. Me and my wife, we know Jesus. We believe in him, but our ailments didn't go away. Like, they didn't go away immediately at all. They actually got to a point where they continued to get so bad that they were unbearable. They were simply, like, uh, you know, being able to see my wife, she got into a certain condition where, like, the doctors didn't know. She had three surgeries. The doctors didn't know anymore. I mean, the look of confusion on on their face um, was ridiculous and and we didn't know what to do anymore. I mean, we tried like herbal medicines. We tried all these things like, yeah, I know Jesus heals us, but like, why not take care of our body? I mean, just like the woman with the issue of blood, we get brought to the point of there is nothing we can do, but this is not bearable uh, until God forces those situations to point you, forces you into faith. It forces you into faith. So we think that he's just going to take them away. He may just use them. It doesn't mean he's going to take them away. He probably, or I shouldn't even say probably, that's totally up to him. There's a good chance he wants to use your ailments to teach you of him, but you don't get healed physically first. Typically, it starts with the mind because God is trying to reconcile you first, recover his sheep, and then he'll use your ailments to bring you to the point of understanding him more. You don't start with Jesus and the communion table. Everything else is going to be out of order. You have to lay the foundation first. Paul said, I laid the foundation. There's no other foundation that can be laid than what he laid. That foundation is Jesus Christ. So in order to understand, uh, when God called me into the ministry, the first message he gave me was, he said that Elijah will come again. The spirit of Elijah will come again. And his job was to restore all things. He said, I want all things restored. So what is all things? All things. He didn't say some things. I want all things restored. So everything has to be restored back to the beginning. And then Jesus comes back to fulfill everything from the beginning. And everything that started from Jesus starting the church has to be restored back to the original order. It has to be. And it starts with Jesus Christ. Everything starts with Jesus Christ. 